God has specifically chosen you to be here at this time and in this place. You have incredible potential, purpose, and calling to push back the darkness and be a light for Christ. Stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. It's time to stand your ground. This is Unapologetic. everyone. Welcome back to Unapologetic. I am thrilled to have licensed professional counselor and author Sissy Goff with us today. I have admired her work for many years. She is a dream guest of mine. We come from much of the same background and passion in ministry. She is here to talk about how to raise worry-free girls, which I know we are all interested in. Please help me join Sissy Goff. I'm so honored to be with you. Thank you so much for having me, Julia. I'm thrilled. We were just doing our prep and we're like, we just have to get recording because we obviously just could talk forever. <laughs> so I'm so excited to have you on. I'm going to start well, out asking what I ask you. every guest. What do you wish Christians would stop apologizing for? I love that you asked that question because I think it's so important in this day and time. And, and I was thinking about... Christians in this day and time, I think we have come so far in terms of mental health and pursuing really good mental health, but I feel like there might still be a few holdouts in really buying into counseling and believing the importance of not just spiritual healing, but emotional healing too. And so I think that sense of, is this really appropriate? And then even, you know, as we talk about anxiety, a lot of the tools where we work with anxiety are cognitive behavioral therapy tools, which you and I would both know. And a lot of them involve mindfulness and breathing. And I think even when we step into some of those realms, Christians can start to think it sounds like the hokey pokey or something. We just don't know where we're going. And, and I think, you know, not only pursuing mental health, but trusting the mental health professionals that they know what our kids really need and what we need as well. Okay. That's such a good answer. How do you think that plays out? Like people holding out on mental health, how do we, or getting that help? How do we see that? Well, I think it's just that sense of surely not us. You know, this is not what our family needs. We're doing okay. They're going to get through this. They're fine. Kind of ignoring in a way the situation and believing it's not right for us to ask for help from someone who's not a minister or in the church. And and obviously there are great therapists that are in churches too, mm -hmm. but I think just trusting that sense of God has given other people these giftings too that can help mm -hmm. us work through the issues in our family. And, and it's really good and healthy to ask for help. One of my mm -hmm. favorite comments I ever heard from a mom, she said her daughter was questioning why she was bringing her in. And she said, you know, I realized that my job as a parent is to build your team. And we have people on your spiritual team that are our pastors. We have people on your mm -hmm. mental team. I mean, your academic team that are your teachers and your physical team that are your doctors. And of course, we would have people on your emotional team mm -hmm. because that's such an important part of who you are. And that's what Daystar is going to be for you, which is where I'm a practicing counselor. And so I love that idea. I mean, what a healthy, whole bodied idea that we're going to deal with it from all the different spaces in our lives. You and I were talking before we started recording just about where we went to school and where we, how we trained as professional therapists. And I, I haven't shared this before on this show, but initially I just thought it was wonderful connecting spirituality and um, psychology. And I thought that was so cool. And I was trained that way. I was trained to do that. And that totally made sense with my worldview. And just if you're listening, you're like, what is she talking about? This, this is a good example. <laughs> um, if someone comes in and they are struggling um, with infidelity and they're really depressed, well, if they are cheating on their spouse, they're not going to be happy. And so, right. of course, that can lead to depression. 
But also, if you're already depressed, you often act in ways that aren't conducive with your faith or with your personality. And so we know that that behavior is wrong from scripture. We know that you're not going to be happy disobeying God. But then we also have to figure out what's going on in your life where you're acting in a way that is not conducive with your faith. And so yes. that was something that it was so freeing because I worked at a Christian um, counseling center and still do. Um but I want to talk to you about this because then there were instances where we were trying to connect faith and psychology and counseling and problems. And almost it was almost a hindrance because we almost just needed to say some things are biological. And if we try to find a Bible verse for every problem under the sun, just like we wouldn't find a Bible verse that helps with diabetes, well, I guess... If, unless it had to do with your habits, uh, it, it almost was hard. It almost hindered people that were trying to find, like, look to the Bible as a medical book. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Oh, that's such a great analogy. I've never heard anyone say that. And and you're exactly right. And I was speaking at an event this weekend and talking about anxiety and talking about John 16, 33, which is the verse I talk about the most when I think about anxiety of in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. And, and I was saying from a really practical standpoint, I believe on a daily basis, if I had more trust, I would have less anxiety. If I trusted God more on the, in the daily things, I think I would worry less and at the same time, as a therapist, you and I would both feel this, that that I that could be seen as dismissive because there is a point when the chemistry of our brains change and we don't have enough serotonin being secreted across, across the synapses that at that point we can't read enough scripture, we can't pray it away, we can't exercise, we can't eat right, we can't mm -hmm. talk therapy it away. There's a point where it becomes a medical issue and only something like what's an, called an SSRI, which is going to stimulate that serotonin in our brains again, that's what's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. If we're ignoring that aspect of mental health, then we are often doing the same thing as if we're saying, I don't believe in antibiotics. You know, it's, mm -hmm. we've, there are times that from a medical standpoint, we've got to step mm -hmm. in. And, you know, I think where I love it is that, like you said, there are places, there's this marriage of, if we talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and we talk about the amygdala being activated during anxiety and mm -hmm. how we have to calm that down till we, before we can do anything else. One of the things that the world would talk about as meditation, but we know we can meditate on scripture and that mm -hmm. scripture says that it talks about mm -hmm. meditating on God's word. And so mm -hmm. even that can have a calming effect. So we really can go either direction, but I think you're right. We need to have a real caution and healthy respect for the chemistry of it and the wiring of our brains and how that impacts mm -hmm. our mental health. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've interviewed Sheila Walsh about this and she says something so good because I just, I just asked her, I mean, as someone who's, I became a Christian when I was five, I've always, you know, it was definitely had my theological background before any psychological, um, it, I think Christians do get confused and hung up on like, so is this sin? Is this, I mean, I, I've experienced that like, okay, is this because I have something that, you know, is going on spiritually or is there a problem? Yes. And she just talked about how like God's faithful to answer that. Like you can, mm. you can search that out. If you're yes. doing everything you know to do spiritually and you're still not feeling better or your child's still not feeling better. And today we're going to switch topics because we're talking about children, but we need to get ourselves and the help that, that people need. I always say miserable, miserable Christians don't bring anyone to Christ. So, I mean, if you yes. want to over-spiritualize it, we need to be healthy so that we're attracting people to Christianity mm -hmm. and to the Lord. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that because I know you and I care so much about teenagers and so much about girls. Yes. How can we raise, Sissy Goff, how can we raise <laughs> worry-free girls? Well, where I would start, and I want to say this really respectfully, and I hope with a lot of grace, is that I think we need to start with ourselves. And the best thing we can do to help kids learn to be worry-free and deal with anxiety if they have it is to manage our own. Because, you know, as we go back to genetics, if as a parent you have anxiety, your kids are seven times more likely to have it themselves. 
Mm-hmm. And and I've been counseling now for 30 years. This is my 30th year. And I have not only never seen kids as anxious as I do today, but I've never seen parents as anxious. And and there's all this great research around parents who are anxious, even inadvertently use catastrophic language. Like that sounds yeah. terrible or this is horrible. And it's not mm-hmm. that, that we mean to do that, but I think a lot of us are overcompensating for what we didn't get when we were younger and we didn't feel understood necessarily emotionally. And so now we're leaning in, in this way that we are almost overemphasizing the worry and anxiety and emphasizing the brave things they do less. Mm. Wow. That's so good. Okay. So just so everyone knows, I put Sissy up to that (laughs) because (laughs) I wanted her to explain that. It's hard to hear as parents that Mm. things you struggle with really do get passed on. My supervisor told us um, you either pass things on or you pass them back. And that was very empowering. Like if the most important thing for parents to do their own work, to figure out their own issues, everyone has them, and to make sense of it and pass it back to the origin, do your own healing. And if you don't, you end up passing them on to your children or your community, your church, your friends. That's so good. So we do have control over that. Like, of course, anxiety, some is just <laughs> biology. I mean, you can, right. people just come out and they're like, ah. Um, <laughs> it's, I mean, it is, it is true. We know yes. that. So some people have to work um, harder at calming right. down. And then I know as any parent with more than one child would attest to, like children are different. Some right pick up on the anxiety more than others. And I think we have the benefit of knowing what anxiety looks like in children, but I think a lot of people don't recognize it. So can you kind of just explain how to know if you have an anxious child? Yes. I love that question because I sit with parents. We do at Daystar, we see kids from eight up to 18, but we also do a lot of what are called parent consults. So parents will come in almost like a well visit with the pediatrician to say, is this normal? Is there anything we need to be thinking about that we're not right now? You know, questions like that. And I will sit with a lot of parents, especially of younger kids, girls in particular, girls are twice as likely as boys to deal with anxiety. And parents will use words like angry, explosive, demanding, controlling. And so as a therapist, as you would do, Julia, too, you know, one of the first things I'll say is tell me when you're seeing this, what are the moments that seem to trigger her Mm -hmm. in those spaces? And, and they will inevitably say things like, well, she thought I was picking her up from school and we were going straight home. But then I said, we need to run three errands and then we're going to run by your grandmother's and then we're going home. And all of a sudden she completely loses it. Or, I lose track of time at night before bed. And then I say, you've got to go brush your teeth right now, right now. And, and they just freak out. And, and what is happening in those moments is young kids don't yet have the words to say, when you change my schedule at the last moment, it makes me feel anxious. You know, they can't get Mm -hmm. there. And so it comes out as anger. And to your point earlier, even about the, the fair and grownups, I think with kids, all behavior is communication. The same is true for us. And so Mm -hmm. if they're acting out in some way, we need to dig underneath to see what might be going on in its root. And, and I talk about kids kind of in this continuum from exploders to imploders and the Mm -hmm. exploders are ones who have trouble with unpredictability and transitions. The imploders are the little perfectionists, often firstborn girls or boys that Mm -hmm. are trying so hard all day long that they can't maintain it. And, and they're the ones who you go to parent teacher conferences and the teacher says, I wish every child in my class was just like your daughter or son. And you're thinking, Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not what they're like when they come home, but Mm -hmm. it is who they are at school. And then they're the ones who have recurring tummy aches, headaches, things like that, Mm -hmm. that we need to watch for. And, Mm -hmm. and so I think understanding it can look, as you said, a lot of different ways in with different kids. At this point, we are one in three kids are going to deal with anxiety. And so If you have three or four kids, you're likely going to have one or two of them who are battling it. Okay, so behaviorally, anger, and some people are more explosive, some are (laughs) implosive, just as far as they're going to retreat, and it's going to be harder to know what's going on. It'll come out in other ways. I know, I remember learning that there there were a lot of... uh, physical side effects of anxiety, especially with children, because they don't 
have the ability really to act out. They're kind of stuck, trapped in their bodies. Can you kind of just help parents know what some of the physical signs of anxiety are? Yes. I think anytime we have kids who have recurring tummy aches, headaches, Mm -hmm. something like that, if they get kind of panicky and struggle to breathe, sometimes anything like that, we want to pay attention that they could be anxious at the root of that behavior. Mm -hmm. And I... I mean, I don't know, maybe I just have kids that talk a lot. (laughs) Wouldn't be surprising. (laughs) But I I mean, mine do tell me. They'll say, well, because I miss you, because I want to spend time with you, because I wanted this. And I think for us, not that we can, I'm I'm laughing because last night I asked one of them, I said, what do I say a lot? I was just curious what in their minds I say a lot. I love that. And one of my sons goes, you say yes. I was like, oh, okay. So I say That's yes. Great. So I'm not going to always say yes to them, but I do listen for when they say, I, I miss you, or I want to spend yes. more time with you, or I want to hang out with dad. I mean, that's such a gift, even though it can make us feel like, oh man, like, okay, like we need to rearrange and not that we rearrange our whole life to meet the demands of our kids, but meeting their needs as much as we can. I heard, I heard someone say this week, um, they were having trouble with their children and they said, and they're always saying they want to be with me. And it was so hard for me not to just say, Maybe maybe they need to be with you. Maybe you right. need to spend a day connecting. So they do yes. give clues if we don't just constantly brush it off as, oh, they're just kids and we got to get our schedule done. I mean, really trying to listen to what they need. I know, I know there's Enneagram now and I know people have a lot of feelings about it, but I was raised on love languages, spiritual yes. gifts once somebody becomes a Christian and uh, the sanguine, melancholy, choleric, phlegmatic. And so that's still like how I look mainly at people and at our children. And I know knowing their love language and knowing that sanguine, cleric, phlegmatic uh, makeup helps so much just me know, uh, helps me know how to connect with them. How do you suggest, I mean, everyone has their favorite way of, (laughs) you don't want to say like compartmentalizing people, but you do need to know your children. You need to know their personalities. You need to know if they're introverts, extroverts. What What are some of those key things we all need to know about our children? I I mean, I think introversion, extroversion is huge with kids because often they're different than their parents. And I have a mm-hmm. lot of, I think, well, both introverted or extroverted parents who have a child who's the opposite. Mm-hmm. And it is so hard for them to understand them. And then I think especially the extroverted parents can often push introverted parents into spaces that they're just not comfortable. That's mm-hmm. beyond, I mean, I do think when we're talking about anxious kids, they're going to have to do the scary thing and we're going to help them walk toward doing the scary thing gradually. Mm -hmm. But I think we want to be aware of not putting them in places that aren't their wheelhouse. I remember a mom who was so upset her daughter wouldn't be a greeter at church with her every Sunday. And the girl came in and said, I just am not, not many of us want to do that. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true. Yes. And having to talk through with her kind of a good understanding of that. But I I am a big fan of the Enneagram. Not that I think it's the end all be all, but I probably learned more of the Myers-Briggs as I was Mm -hmm. getting older. And now that I'm really older, I can't remember 16 types, but I can remember nine, which I love about Mm -hmm. the Enneagram. And I think it is, you know, we're not supposed to type children, really. Mm -hmm. But I think even with parents, I think what I love about the Enneagram for me is that it helps me understand where I struggle more and Mm -hmm. some areas I need to work on. It helps me understand kind of my, where I lean with in terms of sin that I can Mm -hmm. be more aware of too and and how I impact people. And I I think it's easy to say, I don't want to do any kind of personality study. They put people in a box. But I think sometimes when we do that, It's a little bit of a, we get away with not working on ourselves and not praying that God would grow us in certain ways. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's really helpful for that. And there are certain personality types of parents. It's helped me be able to say, okay, because you're a one, these are going to be some places you struggle, you know, just because of who you are or because you're a five or because you're whatever number. And Mm -hmm. so I think it's helpful in loving our kids Mm -hmm. in a more, um, I don't know, a more free way, I think, than we do otherwise sometimes. 
And I think whenever we know our personalities, personalities, diagnosis, things like that, I mean, it's an explanation. It's not an excuse. It helps us know this is, okay, this is what I struggle with, or this is what has happened as a result of fill in the blank. And so this is my starting point. And now I can work on that. Yeah. But I think I think people are kind of scared. They're scared they're gonna like find out something they don't they don't want to find out. But really, it's a wonderful growth technique. Okay. So yes. I want to ask you, because I'm sure you have a good way of explaining this. Um, I think people are a little confused between what worry is, what anxiety is, and what fear is. And we know without a doubt that we're not supposed to be fearful, but the Bible does say we also are not supposed to be anxious, and the Bible says we're not supposed to worry. And so I think that it's just, it's hard to grasp how we're supposed to get better from these things Mm. whenever uh, scripture says we're not supposed to feel this way. Yes. So yes. here, there's an easy question for you, Sissy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that you asked that because I, I do think, you know, out of all the emotions you can think of in the Bible, and and the Bible is so full of emotions, which I'm so grateful for. Mm-hmm. I think fear is the one we're told most often not to do that. And at the same time, the fact that we're told over and over and over. I mean, I heard somebody say one time we were told 365 times in the Bible, but then I heard somebody else say that's not true. And so, But obviously it's yeah. in the multiple hundreds. And so obviously God knew that was going to be a struggle for us or he wouldn't have said it so many times. I mean, there are not many things he repeats that often over and over mm-hmm. and over. And so he knew we were going to lean towards that in our hearts. And And it feels to me more like a supportive, reminding you, kind of patting you on the shoulder, putting your his arm around us to say, "Don't worry," not "Do not Mm -hmm. worry," which is, I think, how we can take it sometimes. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the differences, I think fear, to me, when I think of fear, fear really exists in the presence of the feared object. So if I'm afraid of spiders, if I'm afraid of snakes. I'm not really, right now, I don't feel fear in my body because I don't see one. But if one came in the room that was really big, all of a sudden I would feel it. Whereas worry, I think, is more pervasive. And we worry a lot about things that that did happen, things that might happen. It just kind of hangs around. But for anxiety, the way I always talk about it with kids in my office is it's a little bit like the one loop roller coaster at the fair. You know, we all have hundreds of intrusive thoughts every day, thoughts that we didn't mean to think that just pop in our minds and, and they're often worst case scenario types of thoughts or critical thoughts of ourselves. And Mm -hmm. if I am anxious, if I have anxiety, if I lean that way, I don't mean clinical anxiety, but if I lean that way, then that thought is going to come into my mind and it's going to get stuck. So it's going to loop and loop and loop. Oh, I hope nothing. I hope my daughter doesn't get her feelings hurt at the birthday party tonight. I'm a little worried she's going to hang back and they're going to leave her out. Oh, no, I bet they're leaving her out right now. I bet she has no friends. You know, it just gets Mm. bigger and bigger and circles Mm. around and around and around. And that is more of how I characterize anxiety. I I have done, I have written four books about it now. I'm just editing my most recent one. And I did a ton of research. And in that research, the definition I came up with is anxiety is an overestimation of the problem and an underestimation of themselves. Mm -hmm. And so it moves just from not thoughts, not just from thoughts, but to how we conceptualize ourselves too, I think. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That is so good. Okay, so I want to just go back a little bit to the worry-free girls. So parents, I mean, if you have anxious children, chances are one of you or both of you are anxious and you may not even realize that like I just want to practically explain (laughs) something so obviously my husband and I are both in ministry and I we are committed to not rushing this is just very practical we do not rush them to church so it's very important having been a pastor's daughter um who my parents also did not rush us to church it wasn't we have to get there because of who we are it's we go to church because we're a christian family and this is what we do on sundays and so that was very important to me that they are not rushed out the door because i don't want them having that like <gasps> like feeling of anxiety and rush 
to get to church. I want church to be a happy experience. I can't stand all of the posts that talk about everyone yelling in the car and then walking into church perfect. Like that's, I mean, committed not to be, that is not what we're going to do. So practically it's making sure we have enough time, which I don't, I don't want to hear anyone say, I don't know what I'm talking about because I have a triplet. So I know it's hard, <laughs> but um, it does mean sometimes not being there on time, but it's making sure that they have a good association and that they're not rushed out the door because the goal is not to be there right on time. The goal is that your children enjoy church. And yes. so um, just a calming presence, which can be hard. I'm not a calm person. Like that's something I very much have to work on, but realizing those schedules stress children out and thinking about your sports schedules and thinking about just how often you're like, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Like, especially to a child prone to anxiety, like that is a lot. Like you could still have, there are kids, I know that you, um, probably talk about this. There are kids that perform well with anxiety, but they're still anxious. And then they're the ones that are going to retreat and be like, forget it. I'm not, right. <laughs> I'm not doing any of this. Yes. Um, so just making sure not rushing and that there's enough time. And then the vocabulary. I remember the first time I, w I chose, I was like, wait, am I going to say, don't run into the street because, and throw the worst case scenario on them? Or was I going to be careful with how I explained things. Not that you don't explain that there's danger, but you also maybe don't tell them like, you know, something that's just terrible for the, their little minds to think about or contemplate. Um, yes. So can you just kind of explain other than anxious parents, maybe you need to work on your own anxiety, we need to try to create calmness. It doesn't mean you're never in a hurry, but just think about the benefit of staying calm versus rushing them to soccer. I mean, it's not that important, y'all. So yeah. what What else, what, what are other ways that we can calm children down? Well, calm them down in the moment or just kind of keep our family less anxious? If they're anxious, if you realize you have an anxious daughter or, or anxious son, what are some things that parents can do? Well, I think one of, I mean, really one of the most practical things we can do is ha practice breathing with them regularly because mm -hmm. you know this, but what happens for us, if we're sitting here in a calmer moment is we have blood flowing all throughout our brain, including going to the prefrontal cortex that helps us think rationally and manage our emotions. When we get anxious, the blood vessels in our brain constrict and it shifts the blood flow back to the amygdala and the amygdala is the fight or flight part of our brain as we both know. And mm -hmm. so in that moment, parents will say, they're like a crazy person when they get to this place. Well, mm -hmm. exactly. Because the part of their brain that is rational and can be logical and calm is not even getting blood. So it's like it's gone offline. And so mm -hmm. the first thing we have to always do with kids when they start to get ramped up is to do some deep breathing and slow their bodies down so that they're capable of rational thought again. And so I teach kids, it's one of the first things I always do is teach them breathing techniques in my office. Now, some kids have gotten to a place already where they're not going to breathe and they'll say, that doesn't work. I'm not going to do it. And with those <laughs> kids, I think when we can have them go run a lap around the house or run up and down the mm -hmm. stairs or go jump on a mini trampoline for a couple minutes or something like that, where they mm -hmm. can calm their bodies down that way and then mm -hmm. practice the breathing. But I really love for kids to do it preventatively too. And there's an app called the Calm Kids app. You know, there are little watches depending on their age and what you want to give them, but there are watches that will help them practice. There's a great scripture mm -hmm. app called Abide that can help them do that. I mean, I think mm -hmm. anything that we're preventatively doing that, because what happens is the more the amygdala is activated, the more it enlarges and develops kind of this hair trigger response. So mm -hmm. the, the more often they get all stirred up because of their anxiety, the more likely they are to get stirred up. So mm -hmm. if we can do some things preventatively on the front end, I think that can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Should parents tell their children that they're anxious? Like should we say, would you identify it to a child and say, I know you're anxious right now? Or would you actually identify the feeling? I, I mean, that's a whole second, con another conversation we could have about how kids are diagnosing themselves at earlier and mm -hmm. earlier ages. So I don't know that I would use the word anxiety or anxious mm -hmm. because that's kind of, if we were going to think about it in terms of intensity of the wording, I think that's the most intense mm -hmm. we can use. So I would start with, I can tell you're worried right now, 
Or I can tell you feel afraid about whatever it is, Mm -hmm. depending on what the emotion is they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I love for kids to name, to start to learn to name that worried voice. We call it the worry monster in the book, or you can call it the worry bug or Mm -hmm. smart brain versus worried brain. And then I often will teach kids to talk back to the worry. So Hmm. worry. I'm not listening to you. You're not the boss of me. You know, whatever it is they need to (laughs) say. I had a a family literally yesterday in my office that the mom told me her daughter had named her worry, Mr. Fluffy Butt. (laughs) Which I was like, wow. You're not the boss of me. (laughs) (laughs) But I think, you know, we, any Mm -hmm. of us, the voice we have in the back of our heads, we interpret Mm -hmm. as truth until we can learn to separate it out. And that's what we're teaching them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, then we can say, sounds like worry's bothering you again. What do you want to say back to him? Because you can mm-hmm. beat him. You've beaten him before you can beat him again. And really separating any kind of intrusive thought is beneficial. If you think about teenagers, yes. just with temptation in general. Of, exactly. Okay, I'm not going to listen to that. That's not yes. true. That if yes. I don't do this, I won't have friends or that right. I have to do this with a someone you're dating. I mean, that's a good practice. I know my background's in eating disorders. And so that was something of separating an eating disorder thought from a healthy um, thought. And of course, yes. there's nothing it's taking every thought capture to do yeah. that. You're right. Um, and so, you know, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, but just for our listeners, I mean, of course, the easiest and most powerful way to change wrong thinking is to combat it with scripture, without a doubt. And so I think giving our children those fighter verses, that's what I call them, of, okay, they don't have to memorize a thousand verses, but what's the one that really helps? I know during the pandemic, the verse that really spoke to me was who by worrying can add a day to his life Mm -hmm. and so it was just like there's no there's no way that I'm changing any situation by being concerned about this God literally knows every day and it's already planned and there's nothing I can do to change when I die and go to heaven so that was I mean of course it's like very extreme but I know that you of course practice that this and we talk about it a lot on this show Whatever that worst fear is, like figure it out. Like ask your child, ask yourself, what is that greatest fear? And then you make a plan to deal with it. Okay, if that happened, what would I do? How would I survive? What would happen to my family? And taking the power away from this cannot happen, that thought, taking the power away and really putting scripture to it, making a plan will really help when there really is that core fear. Um, yes. And and children have them. They have them with certain grades and certain developments. And you mentioned certain parties. Okay, what's the worst that can happen? And what right. would you do if that did happen? Mm-hmm. And, and then, of course, um, being able to be that study in your child's life of, okay, and if that happened, I would love you anyway, and you would be okay, and you have a God that loves you, and just helping them work through it. Yes, I, I could talk to you time. forever I, we cannot have a conversation on anxiety and girls and not ask you, what are we supposed to do about social media? Mm. It is, of course, wrecking lives and just causing so many problems for young girls, causes a lot of problems for everybody. But what specifically, what advice and help do you have for parents on what we should do about social media? It is such a hard one. And it, it's the way of their, it's the way they communicate now. It's just such a significant mm-hmm. part of their world. And I typically will say to parents, you know, if you're thinking, you know, every time I speak anywhere, one of the biggest questions is, what's the magic age? You know, whether it's they're getting their first phone or getting on social media. And I will usually say to parents, you don't want to be the first because then obviously your child's going to be seen as cutting edge. We don't want that to be how our kids are perceived or what they experience. But on the flip side, if we're the last in everything technology, they're not learning to use it responsibly. And our Mm -hmm. job as adults who are raising kids is to think about how am I teaching them responsible online use, technology use, any kind of living while they're under Mm -hmm. our roofs so that Mm -hmm. when they mess up and they're going to mess up in the realm of technology, Mm -hmm. we can pull the rope in and help them work through it. But if they don't have any access to any of it until they're away from us, Mm -hmm. we can't help them do that. And so I will Mm -hmm. usually say to parents, you don't want to be the first. You don't want to be the last. So be the next last. (laughs) You know, (laughs) have a group of 
like-minded parents keep a good sense of the pulse of their class. And then when it feels like, Mm -hmm. okay, I really do think almost everyone is on social media, we're going to jump on and we're going to start really small. And as they prove themselves more responsible, we're going to give them more freedom. We're going to limit their time in the beginning. I love Mm -hmm. Bark Technologies is one of my favorite Mm -hmm. resources. Uh, We had them on our podcast and they're fantastic. But Mm -hmm. I think we just have to use kind of a training wheels approach to teaching Mm -hmm. them and communicating with them a lot about how it's impacting them. Now, Mm -hmm. I will say right now, the platform I feel most concerned about, and you probably do too, you're probably hearing this, is TikTok. I yeah, we don't do TikTok. Oh, uh, I mean, <laughs> I am hearing more kids talk about that yeah. as their source for all information regarding mental health right now. Well, That's and the where TikTok they go. challenges where people are ending up dead. Yes. I mean, it's really, it's really terrible. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I just, that's the one right now I feel more concerned about. We're, mm-hmm. I read a study out of Harvard that we're seeing tick disorder develop in kids in certain parts of the country where they can tell they're watching influencers on TikTok who have tick disorder because, you know, tick disorders are a psychogenic what? illness. Yes. So if I, if you have tick disorder and I watch you show your ticks for a while, I'm going to start doing it too. So, you're, so there are these people who are ticking oh, on word. TikTok. Isn't that wild? And kids are developing it. So we just need to be so aware of what's Mm -hmm. out there. And I'll just say, since um, working with teenagers for 13 years, and it's uh, my show so I can say this, uh, teenagers do not have any uh, rights or privacy inside your home. Uh, When they're (laughs) under your roof, you can look at everything they do, and you should. I had a little girl raise her hand and just let everyone know this is how innocent it was that she was about to go meet a 30-year-old that she had met online, and she was 13. Wow. So we shut that down real yes. quick, but she was just as innocent as could be, thought it was great. Uh, when they're under your roof and you are paying for things, you have the right to look at everything and you should actively yes. look at things. Yes. So we could, of course, talk forever, <laughs> Sissy, but can you just let us know how we can stay connected to you and to your new book? And I know you have a new podcast out. Yes, you're so kind. So RaisingBoysAndGirls.com is where you can find everything that I'm involved in, the books, the anxiety books. There's one for parents called Raising Worry Free Girls. There's one for elementary school girls called Braver, Stronger, Smarter, and one for teenagers called Brave. And then one coming out next August for you as a parent for yourself that's called The Worry-Free Parent, Finding Confidence so you can, so your kids can too. And we have a podcast called Raising Boys and Girls that you can find there. And I am try to be really active on Instagram at Sissy Goff and Raising Boys and Girls. Just honestly, what I'm hearing each week in my counseling office, I'm trying to throw out some ideas of here's how you can help yes. parents. So a lot of different spaces. Thank you so much for being on. We look forward to connecting with you in all of those ways. Thank you so much, Julia, for having me. It's been delightful to get to talk to you. Thanks for tuning in to Unapologetic. Remember that you can hear today's episode and more at ptv.org slash Julia and wherever you get your podcasts.